Hello everyone and welcome to the next edition of the BioExcel webinar series. My name is Rosan Apostolov and I will be today's host. Today we have prepared a very interesting presentation, something different from our uh, usual webinars and uh, we will look into some uh, so software and techniques for visual exploration of biomolecular systems, in particular using virtual reality. And uh, it's my great pleasure to have today Mark Baden, one of the developers of uh, one of these applications. For those of you who are new to uh, the series, I'd like to give a very brief overview of BioExcel. BioExcel is a center of excellence for computational biomolecular research, which was established three years ago. It's a European distributed infrastructure, and we focus our work on three main directions. The first one is on the development of biomolecular software and we work with three leading software applications for molecular dynamic simulations, GROMAX, that many of you are probably familiar with, also HADAC, one of the most popular docking integrative modeling software, and also CPMD for hybrid QM MM simulations. We are improving their performance, efficiency, scalability, and we extend applications with features. We also work on improvement of the usability and improving the productivity of researchers, for which we work with several notable uh, workflow platforms, uh, such as uh, Nine, Comps, OpenFax, Galaxy, to devise efficient uh, workflows. And we also finally provide a lot of training and consultancy to both academia and industry by promoting the best practices and training the end users. In interaction with the wider community, we do via several different interest groups. Uh, we, we are there focusing on several subdomains of the wider area of life science modeling and simulations. For example, we have interest groups on free energy calculations, integrative modeling, biomolecular simulations for entry-level users, and several others. So I uh, encourage all of you to get in touch with us, to visit our discussion forums where you are welcome to ask questions and um, visit also our YouTube uh, video channel where we have recordings of uh, already almost 30 webinars. At the end of today's webinar, you will be able to speak directly to Mark and ask your questions. For that, during the presentation at any time, feel free to use the questions tab on your GoToWebinar panel, where you can type your question and after Mark's presentation, if you have working audio, I will let you speak directly. If we cannot uh, connect, then I will read the question on your behalf. And you can always uh, come to ask.bioxcel.eu to our discussion forums for further questions. With that, I'd like to present you Mark Baden, who is a, a researcher uh, at the Centre National de la Recherche Scientifique. And he is one of the uh, internationally recognized researchers in the area of uh, membrane protein modeling and simulations, uh, especially applying high performance computing techniques and uh, bridging the gap between molecular modeling simulations and uh, bioinformatics. He's done extensive studies on membrane proteins and complex biological systems, uh, large scale simulations. Um, he and uh, one of his recent areas of interest and uh, big success are in the area of scientific visualization, for which we have invited him today. And uh, he has a lot of publications in high impact journals such as Nature, Structure, and others. And with that, I'd like to welcome Mark. I will now give him the presenter screen.
Okay, hello everybody. I hope this works. Uh, presentation see, seems see. to have stalled. Yes, we see clearly the full screen. Okay, give me a second. I think I need to restart it. Okay. So as a, thank you very much for the introduction, Rosen. As you said, my name is Mark Bard and I'm a researcher at CNRS in Paris in France. Uh, so today's webinar is about how to benefit from virtual reality approaches for the study of molecular systems. So first I would like to express my gratitude, of course, for BioExcel for making this webinar happen and to provide all the technical support to implement it. And uh, I guess you may probably have heard uh, a lot about virtual reality lately because there's a lot of hype about it, but is this actually a new topic? So I would like to start to look back because this is not so new actually. As you can see here, early head-mounted displays, for instance, go back to the 1960s. That technology uh, uh, we are able to use today, however, that the, the hardware is new and, and better. Uh, it has many improvements and provides quite a transformative experience. But the roots of applying virtual reality approaches to market systems go back to the last century, definitely. So here you have uh, uh, a few more examples uh, uh, of devices and setups that existed many years ago. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, down here you can see a, a room scale molecular docking installation. So these examples are taken from a PhD thesis that's referenced here. Uh, and uh, uh, at the end of the 90s, uh, the most popular and widely used uh, virtual reality device was the CAVE, which is kind of a room equipped with uh, 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 several projectors all around you and you would be wearing uh, uh, um, glasses like you can see here and have some device uh, to interact. One issue is of course the cost and the space necessary for such an installation as well as the fact that scientists would have to schedule a cave session in advance and need to move uh, away from their usual workspace. So it's kind, kind of activation energy that's needed for that. Uh, another general issue that still exists actually with the current headsets is the difficulty to accommodate several users. So typically, except for a few setups, only a single stereoscopic projection reflecting one user's head position is used to provide a fully immersive experience for that selected user. The other users would have a projection that would not be so immersive. So why do you read so much about the VR nowadays uh, when it has been around for such a long time? So I think there are several explanations to that. There are several combined factors that lead to that current situation. First, of course, we had tremendous progress in computer graphics power, uh, much improved hardware in terms of uh, um, latency and precision of the tracking. Uh, the form factors are improved. Things are uh, not so heavy anymore and, and smaller. Uh, of course, the prices uh, dropped greatly. Uh, I mean, you ju just saw a cave which cost multi-million dollars and basically such a headset provides quite a good experience for just several thousand uh, euros, I would say, nowadays. Uh, so the VR experience is nowadays much smoother and uh, with a significantly reduced cost. Of course, one must not forget the software. So software-wise as well, the availability of easy-to-use software development kits that integrate with widely used platforms is one major advantage. So Unity, that's shown here, uh, is uh, is a platform uh, used for designing video games and provides, for instance, access to many of the uh, VR uh, gear that you can uh, buy nowadays. So much of today's talk actually will focus uh, on a molecular visualization tool that we designed in my lab that's called Unity Mall, and that is actually based on that Unity game engine. Uh, so because Unity provides uh, SDKs for most recent VR hardware, it was straightforward to actually uh, extend our initial viewer with the VR functionality. So generally speaking, such game engines, uh, they bear many interesting features for scientific software development. You basically use what is called a project, a single project, and then you can generate builds uh, for a variety of platforms, among which standard executables for Windows, Mac, and Linux, uh, web-based builds, um, and so on. Uh, furthermore, actually, the game engine helps you to hide the complexities of computer graphics programming, like OpenGL and things like that, and it facilitates implementation of a scientist's ideas. So, 
So the majority of contributors to unit mall actually are not computer scientists, but rather physical chemists or bioinformaticians. And actually, when you develop with such a tool, you can run your application directly from within the Unity editor, tune parameters on the go, and debug while it is running. So that typically shortens the trial and error development cycle. Now, here's a first glimpse on how Unity mode version augmented reality implementations might look like. Uh, so on top, you can see Xavier, our main developer, using a setup with an Oculus Rift headset onto which a leap motion uh, uh, is attached, so that his hands and fingers are tracked. And then he can interact with the virtual molecular scene. He sees the same thing actually as is shown here on the screen, but of course immersively in 3D. And below you have an equivalent setup that uses a Vive headset, so you no, don't no longer use the actual hands, but some controllers uh, of that headset uh, for the interaction. And here on the bottom right is an augmented reality experiment using the HoloLens. Basically shows a virtual protein that floats in a seminar room. As you can see on this slide, the diversity of devices that you can use provides quite a range of implementations going from classical visualization to augmented to virtual reality. So you can basically choose the degree of immersion and, and which type of, of, of hardware you want. So what would be the scientific motivation to use such tools in research? So this slide, uh, sorry, it was too quick, I think. No, it's supposed to be an animation, it's not to work. Anyway, that, that slide is just supposed to, uh, to show a user in front of his data, right? So I think that's uh, one driving force behind visualization and analysis of molecular simulation data to try and make sense <clears throat> of the ever increasing data deluge that we're facing uh, uh, and that we try to need to make sense from, from that data. Another aspect concerns the nature of the very data we are scrutinizing. So molecular structures themselves are complex three-dimensional architectures and uh, to understand their shape requires adaptive stereoscopic if not immersive tools. That's actually not so new and uh, a long time ago in this galaxy people have used tools like this uh, for teaching, for instance, to be able to, to convey this um, stereo 3D shape uh, issues uh, uh, to the students. Of course, nowadays the need for such immersive data exploration is intensified because we have so many different sources of data of very diverse nature. For instance, databases are an emblematic example of the situation. Many experimental data sources are now easily available, and they're usually usefully complemented by databases derived from in circle experiments such as micro dynamic simulations. Here you have a range of such databases, and they are often also combined through uh, different sites uh, that aggregate information in mashups. Uh, so my focus today will be mostly on static and dynamic molecular data, in particular related to molecular dynamics trajectories. So let us first recall the typical molecular dynamics workflow. All right, so you would typically start uh, uh, to produce your raw data on a supercomputer. Then, of course, you need to operate some data management, backup, and start to reduce that data to actually chunks uh, that you can uh, process, uh, that can be handled also typically in the lab, because mostly people transfer the data first to their labs. And then, the final data processing typically happens on end-user workstations, where you have a basic a cycle combining the visual inspection and data analysis, uh, making decision for further processing, uh, uh, visualization. Oops, I think my PowerPoint just got stalled. So let's see when I can rescue it. Okay, I think we were basically here. Yeah, then it should have added the further processing. And of course, if you do this uh, cycle, you might have some hypothesis and you might then move back and run more simulations actually. And this goes on and on and on. And the idea now, and yeah, sorry, Keynote seems to have some issues with this slide. Don't know why. Um, 
So let's just look at here. So the idea then basically is to make this whole cycle interactive uh, and to help to immerse the user in, in his data. And so finally, such a tool to enable scientists to use advanced algorithms and interactive uh, uh, exploration tools to discover non-obvious patterns in, in that data set. And this basically actually, uh, the visual conceptualization does not actually stop there, uh, but it goes on in what I would call a visualization-driven uh, scientific discovery cycle, uh, where you start from your, from your raw data, uh, and you do this cycle to come up with hypothesis that you might, te might test, and uh, hopefully you could end up with some insight that you might want to publish and explain to your colleagues. And then again, of course, we need some uh, uh, visual tools to uh, convey your insight to your fellow scientists and the readers of your article or poster by designing, of course, the best possible representations and capturing the essential aspect of your discovery. So here, for instance, you might want to find the best viewpoint, illustrating a certain feature of interest, and so on. So what can VR add to these processes? So I would summarize it as, uh, I would say, immersion, right? So let me define what I, what I call immersion here, uh, because that term has different meanings in different communities. First, I would say immersion in the structural worlds of molecules, which intrinsically are three-dimensional, of course, uh, and to apprehend the spatial architecture is not trivial at all. So we are decisively helped with this task. The second essential aspect uh, to this immersion is the possibility that you are an actor and manipulate the molecules, or more generally speaking, the data you're examining, as compared to just being a passive observer. So you can see an example here of an arcade machine that we built uh, for hands-on folding of RNA molecules, and that we provided to school children, for instance. Uh, or you may also know the oops, folded uh, 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 series game that has also been used for research purposes. So before we further delve into such applications, let us see whether there are any particular issues with these VR approaches. Because there are a few things one needs to pay particular attention to in VR and that need to be adapted for a good experience. You may have heard about so-called cyber sickness, which is a form of motion sickness. To avoid it, it is very important that latencies are as small as possible. So imagine you're in a virtual scene, you turn your head, but the scene only slowly follows your head movement. That makes you sick very quickly. For example, in our case, we had to work on the performance of our GPU shaders in Unity Mall to reduce such latencies. Another important aspect is to provide visual cues uh, of the surroundings, uh, for instance, by adding landmarks such as a floor, a room, or skyboxes. That helps a lot to provide reference where up and down is and where you are in a virtual world. In contrast, if you imagine floating in space next to your protein, that makes you sick very quickly. So I'm happy to report that we haven't had any cyber sickness incident so far, with I would guess about maybe 100 people haven't taken a test drive on Unity Mall VR. The only inkling of such a niece uh, has been observed when people have had this headset on for quite a long time, let's say more than 90 minutes. Then to improve the user experience in VR, it's also essential to adapt the software so that it can be easier to use um, and assist the user actually in the manipulation. A few examples are related to an optimized use of input devices so that the manipulation feels intuitive and natural, uh, adaptation of graphical user interface and menu system to the VR context, and for instance, tuning navigation metaphors, uh, optimizing them to, to guide the user. The last intrinsic limitation I'd like to mention and I already alluded to is that some devices, in particular the headsets, are single user centric. So it's difficult to imagine you would have a group meeting with 10 people, each wearing a VR headset, but at least not in the same room. Right? Of course, you can unite avatars of many people in a virtual scene and provide tools for them to exchange, maybe even quite naturally using language and gestures, but it's still very different from a meeting face to face which is why also the augmented reality approaches bear some intrinsic advantages. So let me illustrate a few of the points I just mentioned. So here's what I mean by providing context and landmarks for spatial reference, which is important and useful. You can see here uh, a membrane protein with a pi-fold symmetry. So we have a natural direction 
which is the symmetry axis. Uh, and at the same time, the direction is uh, of functional importance because it's, it's the ion channel pore uh, of this molecule. So if you then define uh, that the extracellular part of the membrane is on top, then you have a clear way to orient the system up and down. And this is also visible by the background sky box that actually uh, shows the top with, uh, with the sky and the, and the moon and the bottom with this, with this uh, um, cloud, uh, uh, which helps with the orientation. Uh, you can actually also use the information we just discussed for the navigation, uh, thereby making the navigation metaphor um, aware of the context of the protein that we are looking at and using the symmetry as a natural guide. So let us look at a few examples for that, which are shown and illustrated here. These are four navigation tools that we adapted to this protein's context. First up here is an um, external exploration where we may spin the protein around its axis and we want to go up and down, closer or further apart. Then for looking actually at the ion channel inside, we can use an uh, analogy with being in a lift that can go up and down along the channel axis. And in addition, it may turn around the axis. Or we can exploit down here the five-fold uh, symmetry. Uh, for instance, if you were looking at an interesting site, you could easily jump to any of the four equivalent sites linked by symmetry for an easy comparison. And the last example down to the right assumes that you have selected a given residue of interest, and then the software calculates the camera pass to get there uh, and ends with the best point of view on that particular residue, which you might otherwise take some time to find. So in these examples, we did not change anything on the protein structure, but you can also imagine some manipulations to help understand the actual topology and architecture of these objects, which is shown here. So you certainly have come across so-called exploded views that are quite often used in schematics of machines. Yeah, okay, it's coming. Uh, uh, and so we actually can apply the same ideas to molecule in order to examine, for instance, interfaces that would typically be hidden from view because of the packing. So in our case, a natural way to split would be just uh, uh, by re um, extending the, the subunits of the protein away from the axis. Or at the second level, you may split the transmembrane from the other parts of the system. This has actually been implemented in the Unity mall. Uh, uh, yeah, this is the type of splitting, and you can apply it to the uh, to molecular system. So here we can have a simple demo with the five subunits moving apart. And so you can imagine, for instance, in virtual reality, uh, if your head would get very close to the molecule, then it could naturally uh, open up. So you don't bump into it, but you can actually examine the hidden regions, the hidden interfaces. So this example concludes the VR adaptation examples uh, and actually brings us to how we explore molecules in virtual reality. So the most immediate application for VR is actually to look at these invisible objects as if they were life-size artifacts that you can touch and examine. So you can get a sense of crowdedness, spatial relations, interactions, and so on. So in Unity Mall, we implemented and refined this visual exploration facility together with an industrial partner, UCB Biopharma, in the context of examining drug binding sites. You can see here the controllers and the user holds in his hand that are also represented in VR and the menu system uh, uh, that you can interact with through a kind of laser pointer metaphor. And then you can change a range of visual parameters, uh, displace the molecule, or actually just walk around the object to get the view from, from all of the sides. Um, yeah, this is just a few simple manipulations. And you see again, we added a, a scene here, a room, to have this uh, reference uh, uh, where the bottom is, where the top is, and so on, not floating in three space. Again, I already mentioned this, this is very single user-centric, but let us look at some possible extensions. So this is a capture of a VR session on Artspace VR. Uh, using a specific extension called altpdb.info. It's written down here. It was developed by Tom Skillman. And Tom and another colleague from the US, Nick Kramer, were kind enough to introduce me to this platform. And so here we had a sort of Skype in VR around my favorite molecule. And so I'm explaining, I think I'm the guy in yellow, if I remember well. Uh, I'm explaining some features of the molecule. So you can see the head movements of the avatars and also how 
uh, the movement of the uh, devices is transcribed. So you can actually to point at features of the molecule and then what you cannot hear, you can actually have an audio exchange uh, uh, with your colleague, just like in Skype. So it's quite natural to uh, uh, um, to use this to 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 discuss uh, some molecule scene. So we should be adding such functionality to Unity model over the coming months as well. Of course, uh, static molecules, as you've seen so far, are fun for a while, but then one may think also about modifying and animating them, and that's basically the next part. I would like to talk about. Uh, so the idea is, of course, that you could interact with the models while they still behave in a chemically and physically realistic way. So first, a natural way to apply this is in the context, for instance, of integrated biology. Interactive refinement of structural models, for instance, using available experimental data is a very useful uh, tool for model building. So by combining the experimental data, uh, with the human expertise and interactive manipulation of an underlying physical model, you can, for instance, fit models, molecules into SACs or cryo-EM envelopes. Uh, that's particularly useful because the experimental data is ambiguous and allows for several solutions. So the interactive assessment by an expert user is extremely helpful in, in trying to find the most plausible models. Uh, and so, the physical model, we actually found that cross grain representations are very robust for such a purpose. And we actually use these approaches now routinely also for training our students. That's shown here as, as an example. Uh, we have put together a contest where the students have the task to fold RNA molecules from an extended form. They do it through interactive modeling in Unity Mall. You can see some screen capture here. Interestingly, we found that they use quite different strategies actually than when, than co if you compare it to automatic approaches such as replica exchange MD, for instance. So, so far we implemented this experiment with a simple mouse and 2D displays because that scales to a classroom setup. Uh, and the students already did quite a good job on the folding, but we now would actually like to see whether adding VR immersion will enable them to fold even the trickier targets. Uh, to motivate the students, uh, uh, they can actually upload their suggested results to a server, a kind of contest server, and then they can compare to their fellow students to get closest to the known solution. And that makes them want to perform better and, and continue. So translating such an experiment to BR is of course, uh, uh, um, uh, has a crucial point, which is how do you interact with these uh, objects in, in, in 3D? So that's where the VR controllers come into play. There's a range of controllers that you can use. With VR, here we just show the Vive and the Oculus ones. Uh, in Unity Mall, we actually use an abstraction library <coughs> to try and provide a similar look and feel for the different controller types. Of course, then you can displace the molecule, grab and pull on atoms, or you could also implement more complex deformations uh, if, if, if that is needed. So let's look at how an interactive MD simulation looks in VR. <coughs> So here you can see um, uh, the VR implementation. We have just a small peptide. It's actually in a water box, but the water box is not shown. And that you can manipulate, okay, with a laser, point, with laser pointer, you can select an atom, pull on it, or eventually pull on two ends, then you can unfold it. And at the same time, you have a few uh, um, plots that uh, update live to give you information about the energy, total energy, hydrogen bonds and things like that, that can guide you in the manipulation. So this is just a um, um, proof of principle, of course, application. Uh, uh, um, and uh, once you have that basic functionality working, then you can start improving and making the user experience better. For instance, uh, the jiggling of the molecule in VR is not always uh, very nice. So one might think about smoothing the thing or, or, or other uh, effects like that. Another uh, uh, type of modeling that you can do in VR, for instance, could be docking. So here you can see uh, some protein-protein docking implemented in Unity Model VR. So here you have kind of, um, you will attach the proteins to, to the uh, uh, VR devices. You can get an idea of the energy that's uh, actually displayed here or close to the, to the device. And you can also see hydrogen bonds or sometimes when there are clashes, they're kind of like red explosions. 
and that helps you actually in trying to find a, a, a good uh, a good arrangement. And I mean this you can of course extend to many many other types, but I think these are some some very very standard ones. Now let's try to go back to the bigger picture. Remember, I started uh, with this visualization-driven discovery cycle, and I said I would talk about ND simulations. So then, of course, one immediately might think about uh, analyzing trajectory uh, trajectories and uh, um, data derived from ND uh, simulations. So here is just some idea of, of uh, how such a VI interface might look in the future. The idea is to integrate many of the current tools that we have in a generic VR-aware context to be able, to, for instance, uh, to analyze trajectories and data sets uh, uh, while forming hypotheses. So here, this is kind of a non-VR example where you work on a display wall uh, at my institute. And we use a database that is queried and corresponding protein structures are displayed in 3D. So this one is not immersive, but it can be used with multiple users. And you can actually combine it with the VR exploration, moving back and forth. Uh, uh, uh. So you could imagine a single user first explores the system in VR, identifies interesting features, selects viewpoints, and then later on place them back with a group in front of less immersive hardware such as this before. So here you have a small comparison of uh, typical hardware features of such a display wall compared to a headset. So a display wall typically has higher resolution, and it's larger size, but of course it's less immersive. Uh, um, on the other hand, it can have more features than the other, but you have no head tracking, at least not in our installation. So yeah, there's kind of trade-off and you can imagine that you can vary the right hardware uh, for the, the the setting that you intend, whether you would be a working session with several people or just individually want to explore uh, uh, something. And that we then have combined with a tool we developed a few years back for uh, trajectory analysis called Vitamins. And uh, that's a, a tool that allows you to look at several trajectories at the same time. So here, uh, seems to be blocked again. Okay. What happens to Keynote? Let me try once more. Okay, now it comes. So here you can, uh, you have kind of like a video recorder, a metaphor, and then you can cycle through here five trajectories at the same time. And this one was looking at wetting, de-wetting transitions of that ion channel I showed you earlier. Uh, the interesting thing is that all these plots are interactive. And so when you select something in one plot, actually this has an incidence on uh, 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 what you see in the 3D view and, and the analysis, the subsequent analysis that you carry out. And so then we started to experience uh, a transition of such a tool in a VR context, using it in a cave. So here you can see my colleague Michael manipulating a molecule in a cave with a large haptic arm. So this is the haptic arm that can move through, through the whole cave. Uh, and he can action the menus uh, I just showed you in, in the vitamin slide through a tablet actually, uh, moving between the 2D and the VR context which I mean is not ideal because graphs and data analysis typically are tricky to implement in VR, but uh, using an artifact such as a, a, a tablet uh, makes this uh, workable. And therefore we have also tried to improve that by designing an assisted tool, for instance, with using semantic links. So that's illustrated here. So here you would first basically define using ontologies, uh, what a molecule is, uh, what the analyzed data, looks like and how both are linked and then you could use something or we did use something like voice recognition that can trigger actions because they can be interpreted using these ontologies for instance selecting some molecules from the graph here and then perform some further selections in 3d and then update the analysis based on uh, the selection you just did and things like this uh, so this was an early prototype and so we recently started to try and apply this to a research question, uh, for instance, uh, about the redox biology of a green algae called Chlamydomonas reinhardi, where we actually modeled the full proteome of that, of that algae to be able to make some structural interpretations uh, to understand how these uh, proteomic structures may explain 
the redox modifications of these genes uh, that occur in that system. So we actually would like to be able to predict such redox modifications from the structures and then be able to, to understand that network. So for that purpose, we have been working on an immersive data mining tool as an extension to UnityMob. And so here you can see the underlying proteomic database on the left which would just be projected through a web browser onto a plane into VR that you can manipulate with a laser pointer metaphor. And on the right, you have the proteome network uh, that you can also examine. We can then manipulate these abstract data. Uh, as you can see here, the network is manipulated, or here, just experimental data that is abstracted. And what we want to understand is how certain redox modifications cluster in that spatial projection uh, that we can choose uh, different uh, choices that we can have. So the first task in such a study would be to query the underlying database. Here you have an example of uh, typical steps one would use. So you choose some data set. Here's nitrosylations that were observed experimentally uh, on the proteome. Then we have made a further selection on the cysteines that are typically modified to look at the buried ones and then try to see whether they have any particular secondary structure. And combining that with a visual inspection, we came up with a hypothesis that that may be linked to a specific fold of the proteins when the cysteine is buried, a so-called Rossman fold. And that we can then compare to a control data set that has other modifications than natural selection. Um, yeah, so here, then you can click on, on one of the selected data points and have the view in 3D. And this is what the user would see here on one side, the database view on the other side, the 3D view. Um, so this is just a, recalling the filtering clauses I just said, how do we arrive on the data that we finally analyze? And so afterwards you can check whether that hypothesis would be true by looking at the statistics. If you compare exposed cysteines to buried cysteines, you can see that there's indeed a uh, much higher propensity of beta sheets in the buried cysteines. So that seems at least at a very cost level to verify that, that observation. So now, how do we link this to VR? Actually, as I mentioned, this um, database and data mining tool is web-based. And so we then added a, a, a web VR uh, feature to UnityMo. And so then on the web page, you have kind of an icon like this, and if you click on this, it will would open any any scene in a compatible web VR device, for instance, a head-mounted display. So that was actually the, the last example I wanted to provide in order to hopefully get you interested in using VR approaches for your research. And so with that, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. And of course, also thank all the collaborators and contributors. You can see here a selection of, of, of many people. Uh, as well as the funding agencies that you have down here. And so I'm now happy to take questions, and I think we can start the question and answer session. Thank you, Mark. Um, so I will encourage everybody to use the, the Q&A panel. Uh, Mark, can you show the last slide, please? Uh, yes, yeah. Uh, Please use the, the uh, control panel or go to webinar. There is a tab for questions where you can type it and I will let you speak directly. Uh, I have a question, maybe some of our listeners are wondering whether the software is available to, to use and what's the roadmap, what is the license? Yeah, so uh, 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 right now what we do is uh, whenever a publication comes out, so we're about to submit a paper on the VR version, we release the source code uh, that goes with it. And then while we work uh, typically on the next version, we can provide some access on request onto the source code, and we always provide builds for whoever wants to, to use them. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 the code is open source, uh, uh, and then people can reuse it in their projects um, in, in any way they want. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, I, uh, I just saw that uh, Jason has asked a similar question. I will try to connect uh, with him. Hi, Jason, can you hear us? Uh, 
Um, maybe he's a oh, yes, uh, Jason Rodek, his audio is not working. Uh, anyway, he was uh, Jason Evans was also asking whether the software is open source, and uh, yeah, it will be exciting to um, for for people to get a copy of it and uh, start playing. It's, uh, yeah, so, so just in addition to that, so, so right now everything is open source and because um, we, as I mentioned, also work with several industrial partners, we're now trying to maybe uh, enrich the licensing model so that keep, people could make extensions like plugins or so that have a different license, uh, which might be easier for them. But the core of the software will remain open source. Mm -hmm. uh, how does it compare uh, with, are there other similar solutions and uh, software? Have you done uh, some comparison with similar types of codes? Well, I, I think the difference might be that, I mean, you have uh, several major visualization softwares around, BMD, Chimera, and so on, and they, they all, I think, work or, or look at what we are can bring, and they are, uh, have been uh, around for a long time. Uh, I think we maybe had some advantages in the sense that uh, Unity model was a younger project, so we could then really, I think, uh, change the offer to be optimized for the VR context. So because there was less, less. Uh, so I think it's really now the main developing direction is the VR version of Unity model. It's really focused on that. Mm -hmm. And uh, are there any special requirements for? For the hardware to be used, if uh, people start playing with, do, do they need uh, the graphics power? card? Is very very important. So we do run it on on uh, laptops, but typically we recommend uh, uh, something equivalent to a GeForce GTX 1080 to have a good experience. If you have a, a smaller graphics card, then you get some limitations. Yes. Uh, so we have another question from Jonas Bostrom. I will let him speak. Uh, Jonas, can we hear each other? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think VR is, is is extremely cool, and uh, but I, I wonder how you you would convince a, a con uh, conservative user saying that. Saying, I mean, you you can do all these things with the uh, traditional tools. Yeah. I mean, I think it's not a question of convincing. You know, I think it's just once it is there and it works, then why not use it? I'd say if when people moved from black and white to color television, right? Uh, I, I think there were many people saying we don't need the color and it's just a gimmick or so, but once you have it, why would you not use it? Let's see. Yes. Uh, any other questions from the audience? Yeah, uh, we don't have other questions uh, asked. So uh, I, I guess it's some uh, maybe sometime next year when you have uh, already full release and uh, uh, when you get to the stage that it's also easier for people to develop extensions, we can do a follow up of the webinar. It uh, will be very interesting. And, uh, I'm looking forward to see more application of the. Of the tool. Yeah, don't don't hesitate to contact me if you have any further questions also after the webinar or if you want a demo build or whatever, please do so. So for everybody who is listening to the recording of this, uh, feel free to get in touch with Mark to get a copy. Okay, well, uh, if there are no other questions, uh, we can finish with that today's presentation and uh, I would like to let everybody know that we have two more webinars scheduled coming up in the next couple of weeks. So next week we are having Kaitlin Van who will present the Smirnoff format and um, Forceful format which is part of the Open Forceful initiative. Uh, it will be 
next uh, week on the 10th of October from 4 o'clock Central European summer time. And then the first week of November on the 7th, we will have a presentation by Daniel Letzi from the Barcelona Supercomputing Center, who will present the COMSES framework for development of par parallel applications. Uh, this is one of the frameworks that we use extensively also in BioXL and it's uh, very flexible. It's uh, been extensively used for uh, developing a very powerful workflows. So everybody is welcome to join and please uh, subscribe to our mailing list where we send monthly highlights uh, from uh, from what's happening in BioXL. We send reminders about upcoming webinars that might be of interest for everybody. So with that, I'd like to thank again Mark and uh, see you again. Thank you very much, Rosie. Bye. Bye-bye.